I'm Linda Quinlan. I'm Ann Charles. Uh, and before we continue with the show, I'd like to say that we at All Things LGBTQ would like to publicly express solidarity with the protesters on the streets of this country and around the globe in their fight for a just and equitable world for us all. May we all prevail. I'm Keith Ghostland, and indeed, this is All Things LGBTQ. It is Thursday, June 4th. We are taping in Montpelier, which we recognize as being unceded indigenous land. So let us start now with a few headlines. So Linda, back to you. Take it away. Um, my first uh, story is about Chicago Mayor Lori Lightfoot, who didn't hold back when asked if she had anything to say to President Trump during a press conference. Um, I have a uh, story about um, uh, and a New York City Fire Department gets his first lesbian battalion chief. Um, and a black trans man, Tony McDade, was killed by police in Tallahassee, Florida. I have a human interest story about Arlene Hamilton. Um, uh, uh, another story about Chris Cooper, the bird watcher in New York. And um, let's see. Uh, and journalist Keith Boken, who was arrested. And a, a, a little story about Larry Kramer, so um, who died at 84 uh, last week, I believe. So um, now we will move to Anne. Okay. I have many headlines. Um, I'm not going to get to many of these stories, but I have pictures for you. The story I will get to concerns scientists who discover gorillas engaging in lesbian sex for the first time. It's the first discovery. I'm sure it's not the lesbian sex for the first time. Uh, Costa Rica, this is good news. Costa Rica allows same-sex marriages in a first for Central America. News from Poland. Liberal Warsaw mayor injects suspense into the presidential vote. This is about Rafał Trzaskowski. He's 48. Uh, I have a picture before you now of him. He um, is giving the right-wing uh, president a run for his money in the upcoming election. I hope he prevails. Ike, Ike, Ikea may, manager charged with firing poll over anti-gay remarks. So this employee of Ikea um, said terrible things about gay people that they were damned, they deserved to die, etc. The manager fired him, and now the prosecutors in Poland have brought charges against the manager, so uh, who may face fines or time in jail. But we'll see how that develops. Um, Hungary, and this has been a long time coming. Uh, it's a terrible outcome. Hungary votes to end legal, legal um, recognition of trans people. Two years in prison for gay sex in Turkmenistan. The Zambian president pardons gay couple jailed for 15 years. And the backdrop of this story I've told you about, these two. Um, this gay couple was arrested uh, and charged with, you know, being gay, basically. And the ambassador from the United States, the ambassador to Zambia, Daniel Foote, protested publicly and, you know, condemned the arrest. But then the Zambian president contacted the White House and asked Daniel Foote to be asked that Daniel Foote be recalled. So he was recalled. Uh, he lost his ambassadorship over this, but it was a righteous action. And now the president has pardoned the couple that he arrested originally. Happy ever, happily ever after eludes Taiwan, a year after Asia's first gay marriages. What this means is a petition is going around now because Taiwanese nationals 
can't legally marry somebody from another country if the country doesn't approve same-sex marriage. So, for example, a Taiwanese who wants to marry a Chinese national couldn't because China doesn't have any, it hasn't legalized same-sex marriage. So there's a petition circulating about that. We'll see what the outcome is. South Korea activists form a task force to fight the coronavirus-fueled discrimination. And I have a picture before you now of some members of the task force. Remember last time I reported that South Korea had made progress in terms of the coronavirus, but then um, one person, a gay person, allegedly went to a lot of bars in the gay section of Seoul and um, triggering a renewed outbreak of the virus. Um, whether or not this can be proved is irrelevant because the gay community was then blamed. So in response, this, these activists have formed a task force uh, to fight against discrimination. A um, couple of more stories. North Macedonia activists protest as court scraps anti-discrimination law uh, this, this law was passed um, and a technicality occurred. It was passed with the majority of the people in the parliament as opposed to the majority of members. So it's been recalled. The problem is that everything is at a standstill because of the pandemic. But when um, the courts reopen, if this ruling party who is favorable to LGBT people is still in power, then they can just you know, pass the ordinance again. Uh, one hopes that's the case. Now, um, good news from France. I'd like to show you a picture now of Marie Co, 55, the first transgender mayor elected in France. Here she is. Now let's see a picture of Philip Normal, who is 38 the UK's first openly HIV mayor, HIV positive mayor. He teams fashion with politics because he's a fashion designer. And the picture shows you he's kind of a interesting dresser. He's got a smart fashion shop in Brixton, a fashionable area of, uh, of London, uh, which is closed now, of course. But there he is. Two more stories, Manipur in India, uh, plans to set up a quarantine center for the transgender community. And I have a picture of that center. And finally, Gaga Ulala, Taiwan's first LGBT streaming platform launches. And I just want to, you know, there are a lot of recommendations and they're ready to go. But I don't want to forget this last story that I'm going to cover in detail next time. The Lambda Literary Award winners have been announced on June 1st. So that's exciting news that we will explore in detail the next time. Keith. Thank you, Anne. And I'll be waiting to see if there's any names that we might recognize on those Lambda Awards. So looking at headlines here locally, I want to start with last night, the Montpelier City Council did enact a mask requirement in businesses in Montpelier. And I am told that this had the full support of the business community because it sets a uniform standard. It will not be one business trying to enforce while another isn't. It's uniform through downtown. And there were all of the necessary and appropriate exemptions for those individuals who cannot wear a mask due to medical condition or other circumstances. So I'm going to give a plug again, the census. If you haven't done it, please do. One of the issues relative to the census is that this is the equation upon which federal funding is based. And it is estimated that there will be between 43 and $4,500 per Vermonter counted, counted that comes into the state. Now, while the LGBTQ plus community may not have been included in the demographics for the census as we had hoped, 
Vermont's government and infrastructure certainly knows we're here. We can have a voice in what happens to those federal funds once they get here, but the money needs to get here. And it was estimated that after the 2010 census that Vermont lost more money than any other state due to underreporting. I also want to acknowledge that on Sunday, there is a rally planned at the State House in response to the incident in Minneapolis, the homicide by police. There will be a speak out, and I believe there will also be a march associated with it. Friday, June 15th, which is, if you're watching this on Saturday, was yesterday, was long term HIV survivors day. The epidemic isn't over. And just a note, the NAMES project, the quilt, the leftover fabric that they had for making panels acknowledging people who had died relative to HIV, they're using that material to make masks for first responders in the San Francisco area. June is also Asian Pacific American Heritage Month. You thought I was going to say Pride Month. So there may be some questions coming up about what you know about Asian Pacific American history. Start your Google research now. Tuesday, there were primaries that were held in New Mexico, South Dakota, Washington, DC, Montana, and rescheduled primaries occurred Tuesday as well in Indiana, Maryland, Pennsylvania, and Rhode Island. Let's talk about a Super Tuesday. I will be doing more extensive reporting on future shows, but the early assessment is the same as the 2018 election. Women candidates seem to do exceptionally well. And there were some well-known controversial conservative candidates that may not have made it through the primary. Here in Vermont, there has been acknowledgement that in the House race within the Democratic Party, there are three transgender women who have filed petitions. We will do a, a more extensive reporting on this in future shows. And you might want to look for one or two interviews. Could be interesting. And then I really do want to talk about what's happening at the legislature, some of the bills that are of interest to the LGBTQ plus community, and then a bit about how Vermont has responded to the homicide by police of George Floyd, and the acknowledgement that there was a almost identical incident that happened in Tacoma, Washington in March. So with that, Linda, it's back to you. Hey, thank you, Keith. Um, Chicago mayor lesbian Lori Lightfoot didn't hold back when asked if she had anything to say to President Trump during a press conference. I will encode, encode what I really want to say to Donald Trump, and it's two words. It begins with F and ends with U, said Lightfoot, the first out LGBTQ plus mayor ever elected to the city of Chicago. And we must stand firm in solidarity and, st and say this is totally unacceptable no matter who the speaker is. We see the game that he is playing Trump because he's transparent and he's not very good at it. Lightfoot's message was in reference to Trump's Friday tweet that targeted protesters across the country who were demanding action against Derek Michael Chauvin, a 44-year-old white police officer who reportedly has 18 complaints on his record, and only two ended in any kind of disciplinary action. Trump had <clears throat> referenced the racist fra phrase, when the shooting start, when the when the looting starts, the shooting starts. <clears throat> in his comments, the phrase was previously used by former Miami Police Chief Walter Headley, who in 1960 Miami vowed to control black protesters and crack down on the hoodlums. 
According to the Washington Post, at one point in December 1967, Headley said in reference to black protesters, we don't mind being accused of police brutality. They haven't seen anything yet. So um, she didn't hold back on that <clears throat> and good for her. Uh, Betsy DeVos's Department of Education threatens funding for pro-trans schools. Hightown's Monica Raymond is playing a fully realized lesbian lead in a Provincetown series on stars. She plays a woman grappling with addiction and is trying to solve a murder. The series was created by Rebecca Cutter and is dark, sexy, and very queer. So you might want to tune into that if you can. Um, a human interest story about um, how Arlene Hamilton went from homeless to Wall Street. She's the founder of Backstage Capital, a venture capital firm, which was founded in 2015 while she was homeless. The firm seems to, uh, seeks to address disparities in technology industry by um, investing in companies that are high risk potential entrepreneurs who are women, people of color, and LGBTQ people. Backstage Capital has raised over $10 million and has invested in more than 130 startups. She is a proud gay woman and um, she really did a good job. So congratulations to you. Um, then we have a story by Chris Cooper about Chris Cooper, uh, the bird watcher and sometimes substitute for Ann Northrop on Gay USA was a man in Central Park who had a confrontation with a woman who was walking her dog without a leash. Dogs must be leashed in this part of the park, the Ramble, at this time of year to protect the birds who migrate there. Uh, Cooper started a video tape, to started to videotape her when she pulled on the collar of her dog and refused to leash him. Um, and then she threatened to call the police and tell them she was being harassed by a black man in the park and what seemed to be a deliberate racist act um, and you know who knew who knows what the police would have done had they actually arrived on the scene in time to um deal with with this uh his sister apparently Anne says put the video uh on camera uh, i mean on um social network and got a lot of hits and so um after the event went viral, uh, she lost her job and has gotten death threats. She has since apologized to Mr. Cooper, who has accepted her apology. So, um, journalist Keith Boken was arrested and detained in New York City over the weekend while photographing by photographing and filming the protests against police brutality and recent killings of black people by police, despite being identified uh, himself as a member of the press. Boken said the police did not read him his rights. A contributor to CNN and a former White House aide, Boykin, who is gay, said he sat in a van for more than an hour before being taken to the police station, where he was placed in a cell with about 35 other people who had been arrested at the protest. Um, he was finally let go with a summons to appear in court for blocking the highway. So, uh, and also, he, I have a picture of him, which you will see now. And um, I, and also, he was in a, a cell that, um, you know, with 35 people, no masks, no anything. So, uh, hopefully, he's okay. And lastly, I just want to give a quick shout out to Larry Kramer, who died at 85. He, he sought to shock the country into dealing with AIDS as a public health emergency and foresaw, and foresaw that it would kill millions regardless of sexual orientation. Larry Kramer is a, notice, a, no, uh, a noted writer and playwright and his uh, husband, David Webster said, the cause was pneumonia. Um, so anyway, we will miss him. He was a huge, um, 
uh, force to be reckoned with in the um, uh, LGBT community and um, we'll miss him a lot. So, okay, we'll move on now. To me, well, let me, I hate to correct you, but he was 84, Larry Kramer. Okay, I have a story of great interest to me involving lesbian sex with gorillas. Um, a scientist has reported what seems to be the first occurrence of same-sex passion among female gorillas. And I am certain this isn't the first occurrence. It's the first time the scientist discovered it. Uh, uh, associate professor of um, Dr. Cyril Greuter, primate expert from the University of Western Australia, was examining the feeding patterns of gorillas in Rwanda when he made the stunning discovery, not so stunning to some of us. He told um, Daily Mail Australia, instead of seeing aggression between females over food, we saw them engaging in sexual behavior, which was quite surprising. Dr. Greuter learned a majority of female gorillas would turn to each other for sexual stimulation when rejected by males and obviously derived sexual pleasure from the act. Now, we don't know that they were rejected by males either. I think this might be Dr. Greuter's um, assumption. Of the, 32, of the 22 female gorillas examined from 2008 to 2010, 18 engaged in sexual activity with other females including genital rubbing, genital closeness, and mating calls during intercourse. Now let's pause and see to see a picture of um, two female gorillas engaging in sexual activity. Uh, he also explained that the behavior of the female apes appeared to be motivated purely by sexual arousal rather than attraction and they were equally aroused by males and females, bisexual gorillas apparently. The study published in the journal PLOS One states that 12 out of 43 homosexual events, 28% involved at least one female that was also involved in a heterosexual act or the same preceding, on the same preceding or following day. He told Daily Mail Australia, it's not necessarily, it's not necessarily that they have the same, same sex orientation, it's purely sexual behavior. Dr. Greuter also observed that females engaging in same sex intercourse would often seek privacy by hiding in dense vegetation. You can't blame them. The academic said the study was significant as it might contribute to an understanding of the evolution of such behavior in humans. He said, gorillas are closely linked to humans and we thought by looking at this behavior, we could learn a little more about our own evolution. So there we have lesbian gorillas in Rwanda. On to Keith. It's, it's nice to know that the penguins have a bit of competition now. Exactly. So, yes. So looking at our legislature, some of the things that we're gonna be following and I will report more extensively on future shows is there's a bill that had been stalled within our legislature that people now believe will get additional momentum and it has to do with law enforcement's use of force. And related, the Burlington Police Department after the demonstration that was held in Burlington over the weekend immediately rewrote their policies as it related to what is and is not justifiable use of force. Use of force, when it occurs, will be investigated. Very positive and immediate response. There's the Older Vermonters Act that we're gonna be following closely because a piece of the conversation surrounded reconstituting or bringing back the Older Vermonters Task Force. We need to advocate that both consumers and advocates from within the LGBTQ plus and other represented communities are included on the task force 
and not merely representatives from agencies and nonprofits who provide services to Vermont's elders. There is also an initiative started in the Senate that has actually passed the Senate that would give the Secretary of State's office total authority for mail-in voting. The Secretary of State could investigate and establish a protocol by which mail-in voting could occur in Vermont. And looking at COVID, mail-in voting, everyone could be equally represented. People would get a postcard saying, you are entitled to, this is how to do it, et cetera. There was actually move on a national level to try and institute this across the country. It is getting a pushback from conservatives as one might expect, because this would have a great impact on those districts who on previous shows were reported were gerrymandered and that communities of color, people living in poverty, their districts were sped, spread across a wide geographic area. Polling places were not accessible and were not open the hours that would accommodate people's work schedule or on public transportation systems. The other piece that we're gonna look at with the Vermont legislature is there's an initiative going through to provide economic relief to Vermont's Latinx farm workers. These are people who come in on an annual seasonal basis. They are essential workers. They have been excluded from any effort on a federal level to be included within the stimulus package. Vermont legislators have recognized how essential they are to our farming communities, and they're looking at trying to put a provision in place to provide them with economic relief. So looking at how Vermont responded to the homicide by police, and the response is fairly uniform, you know, both from within the current administration and from within law enforcement itself. Statements came out that it was barbaric, inexcusable, reprehensible, that it was their belief that the officers involved all should be tried and charged for murder and held fully accountable. There was this statement that was given by Mike Sherling, who is the Commissioner of Public Safety, that sort of summed up Vermont's law enforcement response. If you're in this job for any other reason than community service with empathy and to provide a requisite level of protection to those who need it, you should be looking elsewhere. We're past the point where this is something we should be discussing. And the Scott administration has actually put in place an equity task force to look at racial disparity within Vermont. Vermont's infrastructure, the systemic response, and looking at what it's going to take to effectively respond to it. And Zana Davis, who is Vermont's first director of racial equality, made a statement about everyone accepting their responsibility for stamping out white supremacy. I always try to ask people to remember white privilege doesn't mean that your life isn't hard. It means that your skin color isn't one of the things making it harder. White silence equals violence. So, and I also want to acknowledge that there have been some reports about an incident in St. Johnsbury where during a demonstration, four of the protesters were taken into police custody. And from the report, it seems as though what had occurred is the demonstrators had moved from the sidewalk to blocking traffic. And that's when law enforcement had stepped in. However, the St. Johnsbury Police Department has said the incident will be fully investigated and appropriate response is taken. So with that, I'm actually gonna turn this back to Anne because she conducted a recent interview that she'd really like to introduce for us. 
Thank you. And before I uh, introduce the interview, I'd just like, since we're up to the minute with our reporting, I'd like to add to Linda's story that, of course, three other officers in Minneapolis have been arrested. And um, I'd like to start, introduce, I'd like to introduce the interview with a clarification, if I may. It was my great honor to introduce, to interview Huli LaPera. Uh, Huli uses they, them pronouns. And in the interview, I used the wrong pronoun, a mistake that I deeply regret and apologize for. That said, enjoy the interview. Hi, everybody. I'm here with Juliana Delgado Lopera, Juli, in, uh, as she likes to be called, who is um, a first time novelist and uh, writer of great promise and influence. So, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Anne, for having me. It's great to have you here. Um, I'd like to just do a bare bones biography, uh, if I may speak of you in the third person. Huli was born in Columbia, uh, moved to the States in Miami when she was 15. Um, I may say has ambivalent feelings about Florida, as many of us do, and now lives in San Francisco. And we were just saying that this is a benefit of are being able to telecommute now because we can, you know, uh, talk to people all over the country. And uh, that's a great strength. So I'm very pleased and thank you for joining us. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to start with your earlier work, just so the audience um, ha has a little more information about you. In uh, March, 2017, you wrote Kireme, which is, um, kind of not imprecise, but a cross between love me and like me. And that foreshadows some of the experiments with language that uh, appear in your current novel. And we'll talk mm -hmm. about that. The second uh, collection that you edited is Quentamelo, mm -hmm. a bilingual collection of oral histories. And that was published by Aunt Lute also right. in 2017. I love that publication. I love small presses and I love the feminist press that uh, produced your novel, which is Fiebre, Fiebre Tropicale. And that came out March 4th, 2020, unfortunately, at the outset of the pandemic. So all your, a lot of your face-to-face uh, -face book events probably have been canceled. Yeah, all of them. Yeah. Um, before we continue though, I do wanna say that you have two events that are coming up in June. One is at the LGBTQ Center in New York City, which um, many of us have been to and we applaud their work. And you're going to be talking with another uh, distinguished writer, Sarah Schulman, whose work I certainly admire. Um, and this is, she was involved, she did a reading at Sister Spit that I saw on the Bowery in New York several years ago. And you were involved with Sister Spit too. I was involved with Sister Spit. Yeah, I was running Radar Productions for four years. Right, and you're no longer doing, did you wanna take time to write and? Yeah, I left last year. And so I did four years there, it was wonderful. We did the Sister Spit tour for four years. Um, we didn't go to the East Coast, but we did um, West Coast and the Southwest. Mm -hmm. And it was a, just one of the most magical things I've done. Um, it's also just a lot to, to direct and lead an organization. It's quite a lot of work. And what's happening with it now? Oh, Imani Sims. So she was the uh, managing director then, and she took over as the executive director and is doing a wonderful job with it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They're probably having a lot of different contingencies because so no, nobody can really get together anymore. Yeah, I mean, it's a huge challenge. Sure. Oh, yeah. Well, the next um, thing I would like to talk about is Fiebre Trop Tropicale. And as I was saying to you earlier, I first became aware of the novel when Miriam Gerba published an essay in The Guardian called Beyond American Dirt, The Best Books to Understand Latinx Culture. And Fiebre Tropicale was among them. Mm -hmm. um, and Sarah Schulman 
describes it on the cover here as breathless, hungry, funny, fun. The new immigrant novel in a knowing see all Colombian lesbian voice. This novel is much needed and alive. So congratulations, it's gotten rave reviews. Thank you, thank you. Um, and I, I'd like to talk a little bit, I mean, um, Gerbo describes it as coming of age, coming out story, coming to America saga, um, all these things wrapped into one. And it's written in uh, what a lot of people say is described as Spanglish. So my experience of reading it was, is what you describe. It's, I, I looked up everything and I couldn't find all the words. And so I was kind of carried along by the narrative which you say is comparable to the immigrant experience. Yeah, I mean, um, thank you for that introduction and I'm very excited to be here speaking with you. Um, it's interesting because when I set out to write the book, I didn't think I was gonna write an immigrant experience. I didn't think I was gonna write a queer experience. I didn't think any of it. I was really attracted to the characters and the story grew out of um, the baptism, the baptism scene. That's kind of like where the story started and then it just blew up and I was just really in love with the characters. And so I just want to, I just want to preface with that because it's really important to me that like I started this just by being enamored by the story and being enamored by the characters and the characters all just happen to be immigrants. And so in a way the, in the aftermath, of writing the book and in retrospect, I really see how the blending of languages for somebody who doesn't speak both languages is a way of mimicking uh, what immigrants go through, which is we have to be constantly in translation every single day. I mean, I've been in the States for 16 years and I speak perfect English and every single day I still have to translate a lot of things, you know, including like idioms, humor, um, and so it does, it does mimic some of that experience of us having to be kind of like always not quite there with the language and the culture as a whole. I remember having a friend um, who was from Spain and she, saw, she went back to Spain and saw a play and said, I understood everything, <laughs> you know, because yeah. she's been living in the U.S. and speaks beautiful English also. But, you know, it's, uh, it's got to be a struggle. Yeah. Tell me about your influences, if you would. How did you happen to um, evolve into the, writing this novel? Yeah, so, I mean, the influences, I can say that go back to me even being a kid. I grew up in Colombia, I grew up in Bogota, and I come from a family of a lot of women. My mom has five sisters, my grandmother had five sisters, and so there was a lot of women and a lot of women who really know how to talk and who really are great storytellers. And so they speak with their, with their hands, they talk with their mouth, they use a lot of their body. They're great at making up words, um, are inventing things, and they're just like great narrators. And I grew up around my grandmother a lot. And I would um, come home from school and I would go to her house and the, the bus would drop me off at her house. And she would let me like watch a bunch of TV and telenovelas and we would both like reenact scenes from the telenovelas and my grandmother was a seamstress and a cook. And so I know that my early years with language really exploded because my grandmother gave me a lot of space to play and experiment as I saw fit. Uh, in my own house, my mom's house was very rigid. I went to an all-girl Catholic school. My mom was like very, very organized and orderly. But it was when I went into my grandmother's house that kind of like free flow um, just really like sparked a lot of creativity for me. And then when I moved to Miami, I also moved with a lot of my family. So I was again living with a lot of women and I was again living with my grandmother. And I remember the first few times while I was down there that I heard, so Miami is very much built by Cubans. If people don't know this, Cubans started moving there in the 60s and it's like literally built by Cubans. And so there's places in Miami that you, everything is written in Spanglish or in Spanish. And you really, there's literally neighborhoods where nobody's speaking any English. Um, and so I remember when we got there and I heard 
Cuban people translate idioms straight from English into Spanish and Spanish into English. And I was like amazed at what was going on. Um, so it was definitely in Miami that I started really picking up on this playfulness of language that immigrants were doing. And it was mostly because like, I saw it, I first saw it with uh, Cuban people there, but then my own family started learning English. I started learning English and we started like blending it in, in all those different ways into our, into the fabric of our lives. And the way that it came inside in our lives was through, you know, mispronunciations, different accents, making up of words. My grandmother, never learned any English, but she would pronounce everything phonetically in Spanish when you told her to. And I would always laugh. She knew that it was just funny. And now I know in retrospect that I like, I will write down all these words that she will made up. I was always a little kid with like the little notebook going around and like our, um, our family gatherings. And I would just write down the stuff that they would say because they were so funny. And I believe that most human beings have just like poetics in them. We just don't pay attention sometimes. But if you watch somebody speak, like they will come up with some like gorgeous metaphor about something or just something really funny. Um, and so I really started seeing how the English that I was learning in school, I got to the States into, I think it was eighth grade, um, was very structured and very standard and I didn't do well there at all. But then when I would leave school, I heard the English on the streets, the English that was like meshed with like other immigrants. It wasn't only like Cubans, but like Argentinians, there are Haitians, there are Jamaicans there. And so everybody was like building in English in however way they could. Um, and that really solidified my love for, for English. And then it was when I got to San Francisco, I only stayed in Miami for four years. When I got to San Francisco 11 years ago, um, the English here then is very different because then it's, it's blend with Mexican Spanish. Um, so it's like Central American Spanish is here, you know, Cubans have it over there. And if you go to New York, it's like Puerto Ricans and Dominicans. Um, but they all have like this beautiful playfulness. And I love it because people are just trying to get to understand what's going on in front of them. And because the reality <laughs> doesn't fit a standardized language, they just make it up. And I, you know, then I started reading like Mexican American writers. Um, and I learned that even at the turn of the 20th century, people were already writing in both languages. Um, there's, there's like farm workers and there's people who like literally when the border crossed them, they were writing still and they started writing in both languages. And so I was very influenced by, um, by Toni Morrison, for instance, also reading other writers that were not Latinos that were doing beautiful uh, work with um, slang or dialect. Um, so Toni Morrison, I read Beloved many times and I like love that book a lot. There's a Chilean writer called Pedro Lemebel who writes in Chilean slang and it's queer Chilean slang. So he died about like five years ago. Um, he was an opposer of the Pinochet regime and he wrote as like the sissy, faggy, you know, indigenous queen. Um, and her, his writing was just so, so beautiful. And it also very playful and very queer. Um, there's another Latin American writer called Rita Indiana, who's Dominican. And she also does, she does merengue. So her, her writing is beautiful because it incorporates some of that rhythm of music into it. So those books have had a lot of influence when I was writing this one as well as, you know, Juno Diaz, uh, The Way Brief and Wonders Life of Oscar Wilde, Janine Capo, who's another Latino writer who wrote Leaving Hialeah, and also blends language really beautifully. Um, so some, those are some of the influences in the book. And also, you know, I speak a lot about my influence with nightlife in San Francisco and how that really seeps into my writing. So drag queens have, have had a huge impact in my work. Well, and that made me think, you know, when you talked about um, your grandmother and the telenovelas, I, in, one, in an interview I read that after they were over, you used to, you and she used to perform them. And I thought this foreshadows maybe your career as a performance artist. Yeah. Ooh. I mean, I don't know, maybe like I just loved and and now, you know, my mom talks to me now and, and she remembers being like, oh, when you were a kid, you were always um, putting together plays and you were just I was always directing people. Um, and it was definitely my grandmother who just let that creativity like explode. Um, and 
She did. I mean, I don't know if that's necessarily for shouting that. I hope it is. I feel that she definitely <laughs> nurtured the big creative person in me by allowing me to just play and experiment. Um, but we did. I used to sing the beginnings of all the telenovelas and then she was, she was sewing. So she always had like a bunch of like textiles in her, in her apartment. And she would let me like wrap myself around and she would just wouldn't care that everything was messy and disorganized. Yeah. That's wonderful. Well, let's hear a little of uh, the novel. Are you going to read from Fiebre Tropical? Sure, yeah. I have okay. a little, I haven't read this one yet, so I'm excited about reading this part. Um, it's uh, page 71, if people want to follow along, and it's chapter says, it's at the church. And uh, can you set the scene for us a little bit? Yeah, so we are in a Christian church in Miami, and she, we're about to meet this um, girl who got laser in her sideburns so she could, like, marry this lead singer of the church. And so there's, you know, all the women are kind of, like, around her and seeing what's going on. And Francisca, who's a lead character and the girl that's telling the story, has a weird relationship with being so um, so closely in this like bodily moment with, with them. But at the same time, she pe feels pulled in by the idea of just belonging to a group and being welcome somewhere. So we're in the <laughs> church. This girl just got laser surgery and her sideburns and she's very excited about it. Very good. Okay. Chapter six. The next Sunday at Iglesia Cristiana Jesucristo Redentor, a crowd of group of women circle and touch a young woman's face. Homegirl couldn't have been more than 25 years old. She just got a laser on her face. She had really bushy sideburns like a man. And now, miracle, she returned hair free, fully woman and ready to testify about it. Apparently sideburns on girls are a no-no for God, especially if we want to marry the lead singer dude by the stupid name of Art, which she did. Or if you want to join the initial circle, which she did. The pastores paid for the laser church with church money and made a point of telling the entire congregation how they supported this dream. Art now loves her. Look at their pure love. Of course, it was an obvious church expense since the girl now will be climbing the ranks with a smooth face. The men stood on the other side of the room while the collective female crowd worked as one big microscope on her face. We all wanted a piece of her transformation to a higher, more perfected female version. It was obvious that all these women used to directly or indirectly make fun of her. It was obvious all the praising carried with it an underlying feeling of jealousy, of anger. Now we all touch our own sideburns, not as bushy as hers, but tiny hairs nonetheless. I remember that we were still not as pure and definitely not as chosen. Nobody was fame for us to become more womanly and therefore more desired by the higher ranks of the church. And thus began the jealousy roller coaster ride. All of us with hungry tentacles stretching out onto her body. Everyone took turns running their fingers along her silky cheek, commenting on her newly acquired beauty. She seemed thrilled with all the attention, nodding and repeating, I've wanted this all my life. I've wanted this all my life. Art is so excited for me. We're finally getting the church's blessings. Envious smiles all around. When my turn came to touch her, I declined. It's okay, she pressed. Touched it, it's so smooth. I didn't want to turn somebody else's skin. She was already sweating from all the attention and it felt disgusting to run my fingers on both sweat and skin. All eyes suddenly landed on me. Tata would later update me on the gossip of the girl's church history. She was a nobody and people spoke of her hairy face as if she was some abomination brought by Satan, only in whispers, only in passing. She was evidence of biology gone wrong and of the women felt a sense of superiority when staring at her hairy body. Now she had undone every single bitch and clawed her way to the hairless top. In Colombian girl world, this is called a revista. In, Co in Colombian church world, it's just called a miracle from the benevolence of Papi Dios who refuses to let his daughter suffer. Amen. <laughs> of the day I remember running two fingers on her cheek, the girl's proud smile. I remember the feeling of being invited into the circle, of joining the women into this ritual. As gross as touching her felt, it was also an invitation. I too went ahead and run two fingers over her skin. Something about it felt wrong, and yet I was inside a circle, welcomed in. The pastor just called from us from the podium, Las mujeres, please do us a favor and stop the gossip and go sit. 
Hairless girl then hugged me. She said, Christ believed in me. I carry her face inside me that day, a weird feeling of closeness. Great. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. That uh, sounds like a little queering of language, which is an expression you've used about um, yeah. your use of language in the novel. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? or? Yeah, we can talk about that. I mean, I feel um, that queering of languages um, can, can take can take many different shapes and so I feel that this queering is not necessarily because it's talking about queer subjects um, which it is but it's also because the language is veering off from the normal and what we assume is a normal way of approaching language and so the the book really picks up on slang immigrant slang and specifically Colombian slang and it blends it in with English and so in this way, it's moving it away from um, the standard, what I'm calling also white English, which is what it's generally um, taught as good English. And it's interesting because I get asked, you know, about the language in the book. And I, and I tell people that um, everybody makes a choice as to how they write. And when we write, when we read a book that is told in a, you know, a third person, objective, masculine voice, um, it is still a choice. It's just seen as the normal. And so it's, it's rarely a, that question, you know, and so like Spanglish is very much othered still. And so I believe that in its otherness, it's queering language. And overturning the binary of either English or Spanish. Exactly. Um, yes. Well, is there, we're coming to the end of our interview unfortunately time has flown flown by is there anything you want to leave us with any final thoughts um well i think that i mean all i want to say is i would love to encourage people to explore and experiment um and i you and i were talking about how a lot of writers sometimes don't use other like art forms and other parts of their lives into their own creative you know, their own creative practice and so um, the way that I arrived here and in my own, in my own writing, it's really important for me to pay attention to the things that really feel true to me and that really call me. And so I talked about drag. I also go out into the woods a lot. Um, I see a lot of visual art and I hang out with people that are not, that don't read that much. <laughs> and so I just mm -hmm. like those, all those, all of those things are part of my, I just hang out with a lot of drag queens and performers. And so, uh, all of those things have such a huge influence in who I am and my ability to be able to craft voice and to craft storytelling comes a lot, not from literature. I read a lot and I've always been an avid reader and I've read all my life. So I think that that's extremely important as, as a writer to read a lot and at the same time, just really listen to the world um, that is not language based. I remember learning once that bioluminescence is the most widest like form of communication and it's not language, it's bioluminescence, which is amazing that light is like what's used the most in the natural world as a communication device. And that just really blew my mind because I'm like, oh my God, I'm such a writer and I'm a Gemini also. So I'm like ruled by Mercury and I'm always just like, you know, um, but just really to be able to take a step back and be centered like language and human experience from uh, a mode of communication was just a, such a beautiful moment for me of like learning. Um, so it's just an invitation to let folks feel inspired by the world itself and see how like the world can seep in into their own creative practice um, in ways that sometimes we can't even like articulate. Wonderful. Well, that's a great note to end on. Thank you, Huli. Okay. I hope you're able to come again and we can have another. Thank you. Time. That was a great interview. And Thank you. It was a pleasure. So I also understand that the name might not be included on this year's Lambda Awards because of the timing of the release, but we should be looking next year. You betcha. And I'll be rooting for them. Yes. Right. And with that, Linda, take us home. Okay. Let's remember, through the pandemic and the riots, we must always resist. Please. Thank you.